Well, this morning, uh, we have the privilege of, of hearing from our president, the president of the Christian Missionary Alliance, uh, John Stumbo. Uh, he has uh, been the Alliance president of the United States since 2013, um, and we are glad that he is here. He and his wife, Joanna, have been married for 38 years, have three children, three grandsons, and two granddaughters, and has, and previously before serving as the president of the CMA, served for 38 years in pastoral ministry. Uh, so we're, we're thankful that you're here and that you have chosen to spend your weekend with us. So if you would, please come and we will pray for you as well, that God will speak to us through you. So if you would allow me to to pray. God, we thank you for John and and the ministry that you have blessed him with. We pray that you would speak through him this morning, speak to our hearts, and we know that your spirit is is faithful to to speak to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. This is a pleasure for me. It was a sweet worship time. Thank you, worship team. That was fantastic. There's a convergence of a lot of things that's happening right now that you wouldn't know about. So let me just tell you why I'm so happy to be here today. First of all, uh, Pastor Matt invited me about five years ago, <laughs> and, and I like to keep my commitments, and I had said yes, but uh, it had taken me a long time to keep that commitment, so driving up from Colorado Springs yesterday was a beautiful drive, and just uh, fun, fun to be here. Second, uh, Jonathan and Lori Wiggins, your district superintendent and wife, are with us, and uh, it's always fun to be, come on, give a wave at least, Jonathan. Uh, so I would love, love you guys. You are very well led in this Please, yes, you are very well led in this district by Jonathan and Lori. They love what they do, and so I'm thrilled that they're here. I have family here today uh, from Minnesota, from Lambert, and from Billings, and so family section over here, uh, thank you for, for coming out. There was a college graduation over in Dickinson, Bismarck, yesterday, and so, you know, since you're to Bismarck, you might as well come to Glendive, right? So <laughs> get to the good side of the border, and then... <laughs> and then another reason, I, like another convergence is Glendive Alliance, you guys are one of those churches that year after year keep helping us send missionaries all over the planet. 700 missionaries are sent by Glendive Alliance as you partner with the other Alliance churches around the United States. And so we're part of this big mission fulfillment sending kind of team. And when you support the Great Commission Fund, which you do year after year after year, uh, thank you for that. Bless you for that. And so uh, I, I get, to, uh, as president, sometimes I have to come and kind of introduce our mission to some churches and say, hey, could you join us? Other times I get to come and thank, and today is one of my thank Sundays. So that's always fun for, for me to say, bless you. For those of you who understand that we uh, have this call of God upon our lives to take the message of Jesus to the still to be reached places on the planet, and you're part of that. So that's very fun. Thank you. And then one more convergence is some of you know that it was about the year 1978. I think I was a junior in high school. And my dad, who had Jonathan's role at the time, Paul Stumba, who was district superintendent out of Billings, and I was going to Billings West High School, and he said one week, uh, hey, I don't have anybody to preach at Glendive Alliance uh, this next Sunday. You want to go preach for it? Will you fill the pulpit? I had never preached a sermon in my life, and he, he was a great dad, but he wasn't really those mentoring, coaching kind of dads, at least not for me, and so I said yes. He said great. That's the last I heard about it, and so I wrote, I wrote down on a piece of you know, a school notebook paper uh, the 11 things that I had ever thought about God, <laughs> and uh, Carl and I, a buddy and I, drove over from Billings one Sunday morning, and that was the first sermon I ever preached was at Glendive Alliance Church. It's taken me 40 years to get back, but I'm glad to be back here. So thank you. <laughs> it's, it, it's meaningful to me because my, I had no idea what was being launched in my life. I'm one of those, re- I never really had a call to ministry. It just kind of chased me, like go preach, <laughs> kind of chase. So, so anyway, bless you. Yeah, evidently, evidently it wasn't too discouraging of a Sunday because I kept, kept preaching. So somebody must have been nice to me. And there's a few of you who are still here from the 1970s. I know that. So, so thank you for your faithfulness. I've already met a few of you. And then how, how you know, I had to wait 
uh, all these years to make sure that the Sundays converged so that I could be here for uh, Pastor Matt's birthday. I, that, that's pretty important. So, <laughs> Seriously, uh, the most important thing is any time that I get to do this, that I get to hold God's word in my hand and stand before a community of people who believe that this is God's revealed word to us, that is an honor and a privilege and a joy. And you add Highway 59 <laughs> to it, it's an extra joy to drive up here. That was delightful. Let's pray. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that in these few moments that you would do what's already been prayed, that you would whisper to us by your spirit, that you would direct us from teenager to aging adult, from um, uh, every community represented here in this moment, Lord, I pray. Thank you that you have the ability to say an individual word to each of us, and we welcome you. Help me not mess it up. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a friend named Mike Soam. Some of you may have heard of him. He oversees Comma. That's our relief and development ministry in the Christian Mystery Alliance. When there's a disaster, a hurricane, flood, fire, famine, some sort of world tragedy, or here in the United States, Comma is not one of those that's going to be big in the headlines, but often we're in those places bringing love and compassion and food and, and medical support and all these things to people at the most desperate time, and then often staying around for years to help the community get read about. So Mike oversees that ministry, and some of you have supported that. You're welcome to do so. He, his assistant, Cassie, got a hold of his college journal. Now, nobody's going to touch my college journal, okay? But Cassie got a hold of it, and, and in the newsletter recently uh, reported one of Mike's journal entries from his college days. He was between his junior and senior year of, at college in Minnesota, and uh, he left the lakes of Minnesota to go to the Mekong River on the border of Thailand. His mission for the summer was to one uh, one day a week, uh, uh, go to the refugee camps where the Hmong refugees were fleeing across the Mekong River and being resettled in refugee camps. And then the other day, and then they would flip back and forth, back and forth. The other day would be to go to the police stations where the Hmong refugees had, uh, had been picked up along the Mekong River. See, here's the story. It was the end of the Vietnam War. And the Hmong had sided with the United States. And so now they were, their lives were in great danger. And so by the tens of thousands, this people group that did not run their own country, they were a people living within Laos and Vietnam, and they had to flee for their lives through the jungles uh, and then cross the Mekong River, which in the summer is a kilometer long, and with some means, whatever they could get to get across that river, they would get across, and when they got to the other side, they were often wounded from gunshot wounds or from some jungle rot kind of situation that arose when you're fleeing barefoot through the jungle. They were starved, and they were well, just soaking wet, uh, getting across the river, but they were alive, and the police, so the Thai police would pick them up, bring them to the police station, and there they would wait until they could be sent to the, um, to the camp. Mike's job was to go bandage their wounds every other day. So one day teach English, one day bandage wounds. And he writes in his journal, going to the police station again today, where 107 Hmong refugees are waiting. I'll be bandaging wounds all day. I don't really look forward to this, but God's called me to do it, so off we go. Or being a good Minnesotan, he probably said, off we go, don't you know? <laughs> off we go. I, I called Mike about that, and, and he said, well, two things really hit me that summer. The desperate situation of human suffering. These people who arrived penniless, wounded, hungry, often having lost family members along the way. Human suffering and human indifference. How the uh, Thai police officers would pick them up like animals, throw them in the back of a truck, just throw them on the side of the road, the police station, waiting for somebody else to come help them. Com complete human indifference. The compassion of Jesus Christ really is a beautiful and unique thing in this world. That simple phrase, off we go, has really stuck with me. As, as, a, 
That's a Christian kind of thing, a missional kind of thing, a biblical kind of thing. You won't find those three words in the Bible, but you'll find lots of off-we-go kind of passages if you study the Bible. I'd like you to grab your Bibles, if you would. Acts 1, chapter 1, verse 6 through 8 today. Just three verses, and you know what's happening. Jesus has died, has surprised everybody for rising from the dead, and now shows up from time to time to have conversations and some more teaching moments with his disciples. And this is now the last one. He's uh, almost to ascend to heaven, and they are gathered, and the disciples, Acts 1, verse 6, Ask him a question. Now, questions are great because they're a quest. You're trying to understand something more, but sometimes our questions reveal how little we really know. We've got some educators in the room, and you'll say there's no dumb question. That, that's a wonderful thing to say to a student, but sometimes you know that there was a lot of misunderstandings and misconceptions buried within that question. Like, you're really clueless, but I'm not going to tell you that right now. And Jesus uh, is so kind, so kind, he corrects three mistakes in their question very gently, very subtly. But I want to read the question, then to show how Jesus corrects it, and we'll see this off-we-go spirit as we do that. So here's the verse, So when, Acts 1-6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, so far so good. They haven't made any mistake yet. First word, they got it, Lord. Lord, it, it's, it's who he is, our master, our king, our ruler. It's high school and college graduation season, and every high school public uh, setting graduation that I've been to has had the same graduation speech for about the last 20 years. I can give it to you in 20 seconds, see if you recognize this. Students, you have an unlimited reservoir of human potential within you to accomplish any dream, to overcome any obstacle. All you have to do is believe in yourself and you can accomplish anything in this world. Go students. You recognize it. You recognize it. You've heard that speech. Well, how's that working for you? <laughs> Maybe at 18 or when you're graduating from college, you think you have some unlimited reservoir of human potential. <laughs> but I'm warning you, you hit about 42 or so just to throw, just to throw some number out of the, you know, out of my hat here. But you hit about 40s too, or so, and you wake up one morning and you think, "I'm tired," <laughs> right? You think if 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 all I have is some human potential, if if I've just got to look within myself to accomplish my dreams, to overcome obstacles, I'm in trouble. And I want to announce to America officially, yes, you are in trouble in this life and the life to come if all you have is what you find in yourself. You don't have what it takes to get through this life, and you don't, certainly don't have what it takes to get into heaven. But those of us who are followers of Jesus have a completely different message, don't we? We, we have a lover. We have a Lord. We have a forgiver. We have a king. We have a master. We have someone who knows his way through the dark. We have someone who knows his way through death. We have someone who knows his way through graduation and all sorts of things that we face in our lives. We don't have to just depend upon ourselves to get through this world. I'm a happy follower of Jesus, not a reluctant follower of Jesus. So, Lord, let's start there. We have a Lord. Let's rejoice in that. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says to them, okay, on that time thing, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. Their first misunderstanding, their first misconception was that, that they would get to know the timing of stuff. It's the when question. When are you going to do this? And Jesus' answer is basically, um, you don't get to know. <laughs> and isn't that the case, like, in our lives? Isn't one of your biggest questions, as it was through many of the pages of the Bible, how long is this going to last? When are you going to answer this prayer? When am I going to be done with this situation? When? Isn't the when question one of our biggest ones? And Jesus says to them, and I think whispers to us today, you don't get to know the answer to that usually. Every once in a while, maybe. 
Some of you prayed for me. I'm quite sure you did back in the years 2008 to 2010. I was a 40-some-year-old guy who was pastoring at Alliance Church and very healthy, never had any health issues in my life. And in a very short period of time, my health just fell apart. Uh, mysteriously, uh, my body lost 50 pounds of muscle mass. In a few weeks' time, I went to the hospital at 190 pounds, came out 77 days later at 140 pounds. Five of those days, I was unconscious. Um, my family gathered around to say their goodbyes, and um, I was literally on my deathbed. After 77 days, I was released from the hospital with the wonderful statement, you stumped us all. <laughs> we'll have to call it the Stumbo Syndrome. Now, I really don't have a disease named after me, but that's literally what they said to me in the hospital. And I was released because I was no longer dying, and, but they didn't know what I had. And so in a wheelchair uh, and a feeding tube, uh, because I had completely lost my ability to swallow, the muscle attack was also upon this area of the body as well. When you think of muscle, usually you think of the big ones, you know, but no, these are all muscles as well. And when a Mayo Clinic doctor explained to me the, the swallow function, how dozens of nerves and muscles and the tongue and the hyoid bone have to all work together in perfect synchronization for you to, for the epiglottis and the esophagus and everything to work together perfectly for you to get the saliva that's in your mouth right now that you suddenly become awkwardly aware of. <laughs> and to get that to the back of the throat and for all that to work, that, that is a, it was a worship moment for me when she explained how that all functions together and mine had completely stopped. And so I lived with a feeding tube, breakfast, lunch, dinner, drink of water, and I lived with spit rags because when I say I couldn't swallow, that also meant my own saliva. I had to live spitting into rags and cups and towels and Walmart parking lots or whatever. You know, I was just uh, spitting, spitting, spitting. I hated it. And uh, five speech swallow therapists kept passing me off. Doctors had no solution because once the nerves stopped firing, there's nothing that they could do. And that went on for a year and a half. Not a bite of food, not a drop of water, and no hope. And believe me, there was many times that I asked that when <laughs> question. Lord, how long? How long? How long? I say something odd today. I would have been robbed if God would have told me the answer or if he would have healed me a day earlier. There was something happening in that waiting room that can only happen in waiting rooms. It's where God does some of his finest work in the waiting rooms. If, if, if we participate. Some of us get stubborn or bitter or angry or walk away from the faith altogether. I'm not saying it's easy. But I am saying there's a beautiful presence of God that can be available in the meantime. So the day came when my feeding tube stopped working. Oh, great. We're on a road trip. We're going to see some family. We're 1,000 miles away from home. This hasn't worked for a year and a half, and this now suddenly has stopped working, and we're in trouble. We prayed probably the weakest prayer of our lives. Really? <laughs> and I'm driving down the road. Why don't you go to a doctor? I'm 1,000 miles away from home. I don't know a doctor to go to, and I'm not going to die overnight. I mean, you can go for a little while without any hydration or nutrition. So while we're driving, my wife did what she'd done many times before, tears streaming down her face, reaches over, puts her hand on my throat, and prays in the name of Jesus that I'd be healed. And there was a little twitch, a little twinge. Unbelievable. Could it be? Could it be that on the day of our biggest need, could it be on the day when we're most desperate? Could it be when we have no other hope? Could it be today would be the day that God would heal me? I took a little sip of orange juice, and for the first time in a year and a half, it went all the way down. A little burp came all the way back up. Then it was some Yoplait so Yo red raspberry yogurt that we had in the car. Then it was a Wendy's Frosty. And then, and then it was a bowl of chili. And I haven't stopped, obviously, since then. But there's way more to that story. All I'm saying is this. Sometimes God reveals his sovereignty through timing. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes God reveals that he's in charge by when he does something. My Jesus can do anything at any time, for anybody, right? He is not limited. 
He's not limited by political things, by weather things, by, you know, whatever circumstances. My Jesus can do anything at any time for anybody, but sometimes he waits for just the right moment so that you knew that he was the one that did it. When? We don't get to know the when, but what's happening is that the Spirit of God is building trust and faith, and it's one of the things that God values most, is will you trust me even when you can't see me? Will you trust me even when you haven't heard from me in a while? Will you trust me even though I'm leaving you confused in the waiting room for a season? Will you trust me? Read Joseph. Read Moses. Read others. You'll see that you're not the first. You won't be the last. But will you trust him? What takes more faith? To trust God for a miracle or to hang on to God when there's no miracle in sight? Both kinds of faith have value, but that second kind of faith is totally underrated. And I can call somebody today to hang on to God even when you can't see him. When? Second misconception, second thing they were confused about. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were Israelites. The Roman government was ruling them. They were not just like the Hmong were ruled by the Vietnamese. The um, <clears throat> Israelites were ruled by the Romans. And they were hoping that there would be something political that would be happening right now. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times and dates, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, that was Israel, and Judea, and Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth. See, they wouldn't be the first or the last people who thought the story was just about them. God, what are you going to do for us? Jesus, is now the time you're going to do the big stuff for us. And Jesus just sweetly, suddenly lifts their chins to see that uh, I'm writing a much bigger story. Yes, I care about Israel. Yes, I care about you. Yes, I care about your life, but I also have a bigger plan. And you're part of that plan. I have a bigger plan. I want my message to go to all the world, starting right where you are, Jerusalem, Glendive, your town, or, or Bloomfield, or wherever you're living right now, starting right where you are, but don't get stuck there. Also, Judea, the, the rival sports team. Samaria, people who live close to you but who are not like you. And all the way to the farthest stretches of the planet. That's God's heart. It's always been his heart, all the way from Genesis. Abraham, you're going to be a blessing to all nations. David, chapter 67 of the Psalms, my, gospel, my, my name will be feared in all the earth. Isaiah 49, it's too small a thing for me just to be concerned about Israel alone. I'm going to make you a witness to the nations, all the way to Revelation. You get this theme if you look closely. Nations, peoples, languages. Revelation 7, that gathered before the throne, there will be representatives of heaven from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Everyone, every people group that you can think of, God wants to have around the throne because no one culture alone can fully reflect the glory of God. We need every language, every rhythm, every hue, every spice, every nuance of the cultures that are re a redeemed form of the culture represented in heaven. So that's the mission that, that God said. They thought it was about them, and, and, and Jesus is saying, my mission is, is much, much bigger than that. And so there's this off-we-go kind of spirit in this, in this passage that, yes, we care about our town but what, and, and ourselves, but off we go with our prayers. Off we go with our money. Off we go with our compassion for people who are beyond us, who well, we won't even get to meet until heaven. And so, would you rejoice with me, Glendive Alliance, that as you have been so faithful and given the Great Commission Fund, that we, as I said, have 700 missionaries in some of the most difficult places on the planet. Because where we've already established the church, places like Ecuador, Brazil, Philippines, other places, we don't have missionaries there anymore. Why? Because they're sending their own missionaries. 
They, the, the church has been built, and they fund their own church. They lead their own church. They multiply their own church. They send their own missionaries. So then we take our team, and we send them to places that are very difficult, like Cambodia or places I can't name from this pulpit because we're online. And I'm glad we're online. Welcome to the online community. Thanks for being part of us. But, but dangerous places, so places like in North Africa where I visited a few years back and it took me 40 hours of the flight to get there and this remote region. We have a community center there where we teach English. Some of you, you have one of the greatest abilities on the planet right now. English is your first language and that is highly desired and we could send you for six months or for a year if some of you at any age want to go to one of our community centers. I was there, and uh, we were on public transit, uh, city bus, and our uh, missionaries always learn the local language, and they learn it well, and they were talking among themselves in local dialect, and then we were talking in English, and suddenly an older man from a few feet away from me in the bus looks at me, locks eyes with me, and says to the whole bus in broken English, now isn't this interesting? Americans... He had picked up our English dialect. Americans who know our language, I'll tell you what this is. This is George Bush Jihad of the Mind. He announces to everybody, George Bush Jihad of the Mind. George Bush wasn't even president at the time. That was past. But, and then he yelled a few more things. Then his bus stop came, and he steps backward off the bus yelling at me the whole time, you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. I was, uh, I'd been traveling for 40 hours, I was barely awake, I was just trying to figure out where I was, but, but, and then just as the bus door was ready to close, our missionary shouted out to him the Arabic blessing, blessed him in his own language. There were 10 young adults or so in that bus who were not listening to the conversation, you know what I'm talking about? That respectful, not giving eye, tact, but eye contact, but listening. As soon as our missionary called out the Arabic blessing, their heads snapped. They couldn't believe that their guy was mean to our guy, but our guy was nice back to them. And it was a sudden witness on that bus. But I left thinking about, huh, the guy really did have one thing right. Jihad means war or battle. And George Bush had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but we were there for a battle for the hearts and minds. Because Jesus died to bring his love and his forgiveness and his grace and his way of life and his eternal home to all who will call upon him that they may be saved. And that Muslim man understood there's a battle happening here. And he wasn't happy about it. But off we go, sometimes to difficult places, bringing the love and message. Even during COVID, I was so proud of our team, the way they pivoted on a dime. They transitioned so quickly to begin to do other types of ministries and, and to be able to engage in new and fresh ways to the communities that, that they serve. Romans 10 is a verse that some of you are very familiar with that says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Yeah always made me feel kind of weird as a teenager. Beautiful feet, nah, those two words just don't go together. I don't think any feet are beautiful. But, but I don't think I'm stretching the text by saying, how beautiful are the eyes of those who see the people around them instead of looking past them. How beautiful are the hearts of those who respond with compassion who respond with grace, who respond with forgiveness. How beautiful are the knees of those who pray. How beautiful are the hands of those who participate in some way. How beautiful, how beautiful. So off we go. Off we go with our dollars, and off we go with our prayers, and off we go sometimes ourselves to places uh, to take God's word. And off we go all the way across the street to welcome that new neighbor that's moved in. Off, off we go all the way across the hall to say a kind word 
at the locker to that student that everybody else is kind of ignoring. Off we go all the way across the living room to say a word of apology to the member of the family where there is a division in the relationship right now. Off we go all the way. You fill in the blank. What's God stirring in you? Where is the off we go right now that, that Satan, a silly twist of the English language, whose name abbreviated is S-A-T. <laughs> just sit, stay. No, don't do the off you go thing. Just stay in your comfort. Stay where it's easy. Stay put. Stay in your unforgiveness. Stay in your bitterness. Stay, stay, stay. No, no, no. Off we go with love and compassion. Because Christ's art is for the entire world. Whether it's the nations or our neighborhoods, or whether it's the nations that come to our neighborhoods, off we go. So right now, I'm at a crazy time because um, through much prayer and leadership discussion, the entire national office of the Christian Missionary Alliance is in an off we go stage. Some of you may have heard, we've been in Colorado Springs for over 30 years. It's a wonderful city to live in. Uh, our staff has been very happy there. We have a beautiful office building, very lovely, right across the street from Focus on the Family, and it's great. There's no problems except this. Our staff comes to our building, and for 40 hours a week, we lock the door and make sure that our staff doesn't have to engage with a non-believer. We're a mission organization. We oversee a mission, but we're not on mission as we come to work. We shelter ourselves. And every Christian organization I know and every denomination I know does exactly the same thing. And I think it's wrong. And it's time to overturn the temple table, the tables in the temple. And so while we were going to disrupt the office, we just said, we can't pay our staff, the young staff, enough money to live in Colorado Springs anymore. Uh, housing has just gone through the roof with defense contractors and space and all that kind of thing. We're, our airport doesn't get us very many places. I can drive. I'm happy to drive. Obviously, I came up here from Colorado yesterday, but I can only drive to one of our district offices and in nine hours. In Columbus, Ohio, I could drive to 15. So there's lots of reasons. But So we told the 100 staff a few months ago, we're going to disrupt your comfortable life, and we're going to move to Col to, from Columbus to Colorado, from Colorado to Columbus. And um, that's been hard. We've processed it. Some are going to stay. God's given them other jobs in Colorado. God's taken through. Uh, God's sovereignty is big enough to work through every storyline at the same time. So he's taking care of us. But off we go. So my wife's getting a new place set up in Ohio. I'm finishing some of my travel, and off we go. I said there were three misconceptions. Let me rush to the third. So the first one was a when question. We don't usually get to know the when. The second question was the what question. What are you going to do? Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? No, no, no. I got a much bigger plan. I got a plan for the whole world. And then the third question is the who question. Look at it. Lord, are you at this time? Lord, are you at this time? And listen to what he says, verse 8. Um, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, etc. So <laughs> they're throwing, Lord, what are you going to do? And he throws three yous right back at him. Subtle, you know, it wasn't a slap of the hand, but if you're listening, oh. Now Jesus said he was going to do something. Did you see it? He was going to send his Holy Spirit so that when we go on mission, we don't have to do it in our own strength, our own power, our own ingenuity. We don't have to do that. No, no. He's going to give us what we need. He's going to give us the power, the anointing. He's going to come upon you to, to give you his fruit, his love, his joy, his peace, his kindness, his patience, his gentleness. <laughs> I'm so glad I don't have to crank out more love for somebody. I was at a fast food place one night getting some ice cream, shouldn't end the day with ice cream, but if I ran early in the day, I'd treat myself with ice cream at night. And, and, and I sensed the Spirit of God saying, do something kind for this fast food team, and I said no. 
I just didn't want to. It felt weird, felt awkward, and I drove away, and I felt that little rebuke in my spirit like you missed an opportunity. And in, in my response, I literally said this, you love absolutely everybody, don't you? <laughs> it was irritating. <laughs> he does, and he has enough love for absolutely everybody in our lives as well. So don't try this in your own. Don't just think this is a go work harder, do more kind of sermon. No, no, no. This is a what is the Spirit of God doing in you that he wants to do through you kind of message. But Jesus does say, (laughs) you will be my witnesses. You will receive power. You are my plan. (laughs) I'll do something. I'll give you my Holy Spirit. Now you go fulfill this mission. The who was really you. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you were in the same bus or knew about the bus, but in 1976, there was a busload of students from Billings, Montana, and all over uh, Montana, Wyoming, students came and got on that bus, and we drove to St. Louis, Missouri, and that's where at Life Conference 1976, I yielded my life to the power of the Holy Spirit, and I have never ever regretted that moment. Thank you if you supported that moment. And so we all are on assignment. We all are part of this. And then if you've given your life to Jesus, then he's given his Holy Spirit to you. You may not understand all that. You may not be fully experiencing all that the Holy Spirit has for you. There may be more in your journey. There probably is more in your journey of the Holy Spirit in your life. But you have an assignment. Ephesians 2.10, that there are... Mark that down, somebody. Ephesians 2.10. There's good works prepared in advance for you to do. There are prayers that you can pray that nobody else can pray because nobody else will think of praying them. There's words that you can say because you have that unique relationship with that nephew or niece or with that neighbor. You have a unique relationship with somebody. You, only you can say those words. There's money that you can give that nobody else can give. Because it would be really inappropriate for this guy in the front row to reach over and put that guy's money in the offering plate. That would be considered theft, not an offering. <laughs> There's money that only you can get. Well, it's only 10 bucks. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't ever say only with God. No onlys. He knows what you have, and he's not going to ask you for more than you have, but it's what we have available to him. The who is you and me. So one of my funnest trips as president was to go to Manila, Philippines. I was invited to be their speaker for their national conference. Now, there's five countries in the world that in the Christian Mission Alliance that have outgrown the, the parent. We're the parent in the United States, but Vietnam, more than a million believers strong. <laughs> Our Alliance Church is there. Another, but Philippines is one of those places. So there was, they rented this auditorium that held about 4,000 people, and uh, there was at least 3,000 there. And they, you know those big jumbotron screens like you'll see at a stadium? Um, and uh, this is newer technology here, but it was, it was a, this was five years ago when it was Philippines. It was a little older. But, but these big screens that all had electricity, no, no, no projector shining on them, but the screens themselves lit up. And there was two of them, one on, one on each side. And they had worked fine all week uh, for the worship time. And I don't use, as you noticed, I don't use a lot of pictures or, that, or, or PowerPoint or that kind of thing. But on the last day, the president, who's called Bishop, kind of end me that, but the Bishop of the Christian Missionary Alliance Church in the Philippines asked if I'd share my testimony that, that I told you just very, very quickly, the, the healing story. And so <clears throat> I use about 18 photos and a video when I tell that story. And so they, the, the, the sound guys had it, the, the tech team, the media guys had it. It was all ready to go. But I got there that morning, and the screens were black, blank. And I said to the tech guy, what's going on? He said, no electricity. Well, I don't know in Manila, Philippines, what quite that means, but it didn't sound very good to me. And so the worship team gets up, and they had to do the say a line, sing a line, say a line, sing a line, because there's no words on the screen. And I started to pray. God, I need those screens. And little flashes of digital nonsense went on the screen, then they went back again. I was sitting next to a friend of mine named Don, who's like Mr. Spiritual Warfare, College of Prayer, kind of rebuke demons kind of guy. And so I said, Don, I need those screens. Pray. And Don does this. 
So he's rebuking demons, and the whole screen lights up with digital nonsense and then goes black again. And I said, well, you got more than I did, buddy. <laughs> now it's time to preach. So I'm standing up there, and I'm distracted. Black, black, black. Finally, I just stopped, and I said to this crowd, uh, you've noticed that the screens aren't working today. Uh, I'm about to need them for what I'm going to present to you. Would you just break into prayer huddles all over this auditorium and ask God to give us those screens? They did. I wished I had set a timer. <laughs> Back to the when question. <laughs> those screens lit up just in time, worked perfectly, didn't falter the rest of the service. Very fun. About a year or two later, just sometime shortly before COVID, I was speaking somewhere in the United States, and a Filipino woman came running up to me afterwards. And she said, Dr. Stumbo, Dr. Stumbo, do you remember when you spoke in the Philippines? Oh, I remember very well. It was very joyful. Do you remember that day that the screens didn't work? Oh, yeah, I remember. Do you remember how you asked? She, she, she was retelling me the whole story. And then she said this. We're still telling that story in the Philippines. Now, why? Why? If, if God had answered my prayers, I would have had a story to tell. Or if God had answered Don's in my prayers, we would have had a story to tell. But hear this, hear this. The kingdom of God rarely advances in this through world through one or two people alone. You've had great pastoral leadership in this place. But if you're thinking that the pastors are the ones through whom the kingdom of God advances, I have wonderful news for you. His plan advances through all of us. The kingdom of God advances in this world most when all of us find our part, when all of us see that we're part of the who. What's my place? What do I have to offer? What's my contribution? And do not, again, tell God it's only this. Stop that only stuff. So, when, Lord, you don't get to know. What are you going to do? My vision is for the whole world. Who is going to do it? <laughs> I'm going to empower you to do it. I've got two stories to close with, if you would be so kind to let me close with two stories. In the back, uh, there are some books that donors have already paid for the printing of it. So if you give a donation, all the money goes to the Great Commission Fund. But one of them is a book that I just wrote on the church, a study of each of the churches of the New Testament. But, and I don't usually do this, but yesterday it struck me as I drove across the line from Wyoming into God's country. I mean, I drove across the line from Wyoming into Montana, and I, I didn't expect to see the big billboard on 59 that says, the white crosses are in memory of those who've died on the highway because one of those somewhere in the state is my dad, who, while serving, was killed on the road. And so I write this. He was a good pastor, good dad, good role model. I was 26 when the unthinkable phone call came announcing that he had been killed on impact in a car accident. I was devastated. On a February afternoon in Minnesota, a lifelong family friend read scripture at dad's graveside service. As the cold winds blew crumbles of snow across the frozen ground, ground that would soon cradle my father's lifeless body, I heard these words read by our friend. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is, store, is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Second Timothy chapter 4. My tears flowed with this well-chosen passage. Standing by the casket, I was instantly aware of two things. First, those words were true of my father. He had finished well. He had run and fought and kept the faith, and reward was waiting. Second, I knew that I, like him, had a calling to the church. I didn't know if it would be as a pastor. I didn't know if I should remain in my current location. I didn't know anything about my future, but I did know that I had a race, a fight, a faith, and I was not to quit now or ever. Your story and mine are different, 
Our callings are different. Our settings are different. Our giftings and passions and personalities and a hundred other things are different. But a few things are the same. Our allegiance to the Christ. Our salvation is in Him. Our guidance comes from His Spirit and His Word. Our community is within a local congregation. And our assignment is to bear witness to the ends of the earth. In short, let's be the church. As the worship team comes, this uh, whole movement called the Christian Mystery Alliance that you're part of one of 2,000 churches here in the United States was started by a man named A.B. Simpson. He didn't know he was starting a denomination. He just thought he was starting one local church because he was pastor in New York City at a very influential church, one of those the church-to-be kind of places. He was making $120-some thousand dollars a year in modern-day equivalents as pastor of that church. And, but his church, who took in new members every time the elders met, refused to take in some new members one night, some new immigrants to America that had come to faith in Jesus, and they said, Pastor, that's wonderful they've come to Jesus, but they can't come to this church. And he resigned. And started, he asked the church not to join him. He didn't want to split his congregation. And with a little handful of eight people, he launched a, a new church and a Bible training school for future missionaries and a magazine. And he was an entrepreneur. And 130 years later, we've got 2,000 churches here in the States, 22,000 worldwide. Six million people following Jesus. It was his funeral service. The vocalist, the soloist for the funeral service wrote about it later, and we just found a record of it in our archives. And he writes that what a powerful service it was as they honored this godly man. But as the horse-drawn carriage carried his body away, a silence came over this crowd standing outside. Not only had they lost a much-loved friend, but they had lost the leader of this growing organization, and they didn't know what was going to happen next. And in the silence, suddenly one voice began to sing. It was a new song at the time. Other voices soon joined. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long, till we shout the glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. And friends, one more time, one more time, off we go. This time, not across the hall or across the ocean, but this time through the skies to meet the Lord in the air. Off we go. Let's stay obedient today. Bless you.